Hello, everyone, and welcome to the debate on the follow-up uh, EU action plan on childhood obesity. Uh, let me start with letting you know that this discussion is organized in framework of the Horizon 2020 STOP project dedicated to tackling childhood obesity. The project is producing valuable new research insights, but it is also, as you will see today, contributing to and animating policy debates. I hope you will find it useful, and I count on your sharp minds and probing questions to turn this from yet another webinar into a valuable interactive experience. Now, childhood obesity is a major health problem in Europe with dire long-term consequences for our health, society, and economy. But we are still far away from decisively holding and reversing childhood obesity. Current trends indicate that there will be over 10 million children in the region affected by obesity by 2030. Not surprisingly, there are ample policy opportunities to tackle obesity, from Europe's beating cancer plan over the farm to fork strategy to the upcoming child guarantee. So the European policy provides many entry points for action. The flagship Europe's Beating Cancer Plan explicitly recognizes obesity as an important risk factor for cancer. The plan commits to evaluate and follow up uh, on the EU Action Plan on Childhood Obesity, which just expired in 2020. So this interactive debate is meant to do exactly that, to reflect on and provide input into how a next European action plan to tackle childhood obesity should look like. What has worked well so far? What new insights did we gain? Which approaches should be prioritized? Which interventions work best? What types of activities were less effective and can be left out? To reflect on these questions, we have a very exciting panel today, but we also warmly welcome you as audience to offer your input questions and viewpoints. Let me first share a couple of housekeeping notes. So for you to share your perspectives or views or approaches uh, to address childhood obesity, you can use the chat box. Um, for the questions to the panelists and the speakers, you can use the questions and answers function. Uh, please note that the event will be recorded and then hosted on the STOP Project's website. And please be active and interactive during the debate. The format of this debate will be the following. We will first have Sara Serdas, member of European Parliament, to talk us through her views of opportunities and gaps in the EU policy on childhood obesity. And this will be followed up by a panel that will discuss, that will discuss what are the next steps for European action on childhood obesity. We will have Franco Sassi from the Imperial College of London and the lead, uh, the consortium lead of the STOP um, project. We will have Kremlin Vikramasinghe from the World Health Organization and Jacqueline Bauman Busato from the European Association for the Study of Obesity. Unfortunately, Professor Knut Inge Klepp from Oslo University and coordinator of the Horizon 2020 Co-Create project could not be with us today. But if COVID has taught us anything, then it must be that our plans are there to be adjusted and adjusted last minute. Now, before passing the floor to our first speaker, let me first introduce her with a bit more detail. Sara Cerdas is a Portuguese medical doctor and politician serving as a member of the European Parliament. And in Parliament, she is member of the Committee uh, on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety. She co-chairs the European Parliament's Health Working Group. She's the vice, vice chair of the Special Committee on Beating Cancer, and she's the member of the MEPs Against Cancer Group. Oh, and there is more. She's also vice chair of the interest group on obesity and health systems resilience. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for <laughs> the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you very much again 
for the invitation to being here. Uh, it is true I'm going to share for you in the next uh, 45 minutes my views on what are the challenges, the gaps, what can we do in order to uh, have uh, what, what's next for this European action. As you know, um, we're going to speak very much about it today, is that overweightness, obesity and diet-related non-communicable diseases have risen in a dramatic uh, way in the past decade. And that includes childhood obesity. This global increase in overweight children is mainly linked to a shift in diet towards foods that are um, not so healthy, that are high on fat, salt, sugar, and it has also go pair in pair with um, less healthier environments and less physical activities. We also have that children who are overweight or obese are at greater risk of poorer health, not only in the adolescence, but also is a risk factor for other non-communicable diseases in adult life. This means that overweightness and obesity are risk factors not only for diseases in children and adolescents, but it can be a risk factor for many other diseases and can have severe impact in the morbidity, but also in the mortality of EU citizens. Um, that is why the main reason why tackling childhood obesity must be among our priorities for health as it will improve the long-term outcomes of health and well-being in the whole population. We know also um, that promotion of healthy diets and lifestyles, it's a matter of national competence. It falls under the provision of health care. However, we have, as European Union, we have a shared competence on protection of public health, and this we have the potential to improve food environments, make healthier choices easier. And that's one of the goals we, ha we must have. The European policy actually provides many entry points for action. And I would like just to enumerate a few so we can proceed to the debate on those, on what can we do. We have the EU action plan that has been uh, from 2014 to 20. It was based on several key areas for action, including the support for a healthy start in life and promotion of healthier environments, and this especially in schools and preschools. We also know that now there's a call in the European Beating Cancer Plan for this um, action uh, plan on childhood obesity to for a new uh, action plan on childhood obesity. We must keep pushing forward, not lose the momentum uh, that uh, we have now when health is so high in the agenda. Besides, uh, we also have the EU for Health program. We have 5.1 billion euros of funding and we there are working specific programs and also one of the main goals is on disease prevention and health promotion. And this is, this is directly and indirectly related to tackling uh, overweight um, and obesity in, childhood, in children. We also have the European Beating Cancer Plan, which recognizes we're now finishing the negotiations on what we're going to have as a parliament report, but recognizes obesity as an important risk factor for cancer and it also stipulates that addressing obesity should start at an early age. We also aim to start a campaign on healthy lifestyle for all. Another one of the strategies we're working at the EU level is the farm to fork strategy, which basically we're going to discuss it next plenary session, then proceed to trilogues. But it basically aims to promote healthy diets to proposing harmonized front of pack nutrition labeling and setting uh, nutrient profiles that uh, are harmful to health and nutrition um, claims on foods that have an unhealthy profile. So it very simply it just, we aim to have um, 
um, for the consumers, for them to have an easier choice when they are consuming uh, food products in the EU. And we're going to set a minimum mandatory criteria for sustainable food procurement and also a revision of the EU school scheme. The EU school, skill, uh, school scheme sorry, is supported by the common agriculture policy and supports the distribution of healthy uh, foods uh, in, in schools, such as fruit, veggies, milk, together with educational measures here, focusing on health education for healthy eating habits. And this will have an, an, uh, a fun funding of 250 million euros, and it will involve it will reach more than 30 million children. Finally, we have the European Childhood Guarantee. So it was very important during the negotiations at the um, Social Summit in Porto. And with this child guarantee, we aim to ensure that every children in Europe at risk of poverty or social exclusion has access to the most basic of rights. And this includes healthcare, education, and nutrition. So now we just need to keep working and pushing hard on evidence-based solutions to tackle childhood obesity, focus on promotion of healthier diets, not only for children, but also for adults. And healthier diets for children means it's one of the best investments we can do in the youth, um, in the young EU generation for good health outcomes in the medium and long term. We have uh, lots of opportunities to halt and reverse the current uh, overweight and obesity trends. As a parliamentarian, I'm fully committed to these uh, opportunities, to increase these opportunities, to work on them, to, but we need um, this work to be together with everyone involved to make it a reality. So I really, I finish here. I hope this debate will help to lay the foundations for this very important work we have ahead, this intersectorial work we have ahead. And once again, thank you very much for having me and for hearing me. Thank you very much. I'm conscious of time and I know that you need to disappear in two minutes. Can we steal one more minute of your time with one question only? Question only. Sure, sure, of course. So, what openings, like very specific concrete ones, do you see in the coming months for putting tackling childhood obesity higher on the EU policy agenda? Yes, I see it uh, through three of the main reports we have ongoing which is um, a farm support strategy. And there you already have your, your MEPs working on that. It's going on discussion for plenary. We're working on having an, an ambitious proposal. Farm to fork, it, it means that we want to make the food chain more sustainable. And that means we must tackle also what is available to the final consumer. We must not have uh, a cheeseburger being more cheap than a full nutritional meal, like a, a home a, a salad or, or something more healthier with less trans fats and sugars and processed food. And this is the reality at the moment we aim to shift it. That's in the Farm to Fork report. We have the European Beating Cancer Plan, which recognizes um, obesity, as an important risk factor. And thirdly, I don't know if thirdly exists in English, but on third, we have the EU for Health program. The EU for Health program now has, um, has a, a, a finance of 5.1 billion. Uh, the trouble here that I'm having a bit of difficulty understanding is how can we use this funding for uh, disease uh, prevention? And this will include uh, the fight on childhood obesity. Why? Because we already have that two billions of that uh, EU for Health program will go to cancer. And now there's a proposal to have 2.8 um, billions from EU for Health for the head of, for the new health authority uh, proposal by the commission that won't come to the parliament. That means we only have 300 million left 
for all the other non-communicable diseases. Of course, you can say uh, we can go to the cancer funding, get this part, but we need to have a more robust approach. And for that, of course, we need um, better funding options. So this is something we have been working very keen on. And uh, most of all, I have a new European action plan on, on obesity, and that's very important that uh, comes out in the near future. Thank you very much. Fully agree. Um, thank you very much once again for your time. It was lovely having you with us. Uh, thank I you for having you will, you will a great up. debate. Lovely. Thank you. I hope you will follow up on the outcome of this, uh, of this uh, debate. We will share the output with you. And uh, we can now move on to the rest of our speakers. Uh, for the sake of efficiency, let me introduce them uh, all at the same time. Uh, so uh, we have with us, as I mentioned, Franco Sassi, and he's the director of the Center for Health Economics and Policy Innovation at the Imperial College of London. He's also senior health economist at the OECD. He coordinates the Horizon 2020 STOP project, and he has authored and edited a large number of publications on economic aspects of public health. Kremlin Vikramasinghe is joining us as the acting head of the WHO European Office for Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases based in Moscow. He leads the Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity Program, and previously he acted as co-director of the WHO Collaborating Center on Population Approaches to NCD uh, Prevention at the University of Oxford. Last but not least, we are joined by Jacqueline bauman Busato. Uh, the EASO EU policy lead. Um, she has worked in the Brussels environment for the past 23 years towards transforming health ecosystems from policy to reality. And she is a pioneer of a multi-stakeholder coalition building for societal impact. So I would like to welcome you warmly all to this uh, panel and to invite you, Franco, to deliver your first uh, opening note. Thank you. Thank you, Mirka. I think my video is stopped at the moment by the host, uh, so uh, it will be activated and I, I assume my slide presentation is going to be shown in a moment. Uh, so the, uh, thank you. Uh, so the, I just want to make one small correction to what you said, Mirka. I'm no longer with the OECD. I mean, that I, I, my position is entirely within, with Imperial College. Uh, uh, it has been for about a year, uh, so th th that's a, a small correction, but thank you very much for your kind introduction. My role here is uh, uh, as principal investigator of the STOP project, uh, which is um, in its final phase now, uh, although we still have about a year to go, so I, the, the uh, outputs that I'm going to present, the results uh, that I'm going to present uh, uh, not quite reflecting, you know, the full range of results uh, that, that we are expecting uh, by the end of the project. Uh, so uh, let me start uh, with, with the next one, uh, just to show you the breadth of uh, participation in, uh, in the STOP project. Uh, we were really uh, putting a multi-actor approach idea in, into practice in, uh, in STOP. Uh, as you can see, we have a wide variety of uh, of partners uh, that range from uh, national public health agencies to research organizations, uh, to civil society, uh, international organizations like the WHO, the OECD, and, uh, and the International Agency for Research on Cancer, to even uh, some business-related organizations. Uh, and we have been trying to bring together all these uh, partners uh, uh, to produce the outputs uh, that we can see in the next slide, uh, please, uh, the, that we plan to produce in the different components of the STOP project uh, by the end of the project. Uh, so the uh, first area uh, is epidemiological surveillance. We, we want to uh, understand, get a, a better understanding of what childhood obesity is and how it has been developing in, uh, in different countries in Europe and what the uh, population groups in different countries in Europe uh, are that are most affected by, by childhood obesity. Uh, the second uh, big stream of work uh, that we have in the STOP project uh, is research on the determinants of childhood obesity 
and on the impacts of policies and interventions uh, to address the problem uh, in uh, in uh, uh, Europe and in different uh, European countries. Uh, uh, all this work, uh, particularly the policy work, uh, that is what I'm going to uh, focus on in my presentation today, is leading to the production of uh, uh, policy briefs and toolkits uh, under the leadership of the WHO for the design to help uh, governments uh, design and implement uh, uh, key policies uh, that, that we view as uh, uh, essential for addressing the problem of childhood obesity in Europe. And then uh, the fourth uh, stream of work uh, is uh, aimed at the production of a viable multi-stakeholder framework uh, through the uh, participation of uh, multiple actors uh, and multiple stakeholders uh, in the project. Uh, we, we are really building uh, a, an approach, an engagement approach uh, that will lead uh, uh, to the uh, co-creation of policies uh, across different uh, uh, stakeholders uh, in the future, at least that, that is what we aim to do. Can I have the next one, please? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, dig a, a bit deeper into some of the policy areas that we've been addressing in STOP. And, and the starting point is really uh, the uh, recognition that the uh, evidence base uh, upon which the last uh, action plan on, on childhood obesity was built uh, has changed dramatically. Uh, and the evidence that we've been uh, uh, gathering over the past few years uh, since the uh, latest action plan was developed uh, uh, is telling us a lot about uh, the direction in which the new action plan should develop. Uh, and I'm really touching upon many points uh, that have been emphasized uh, by Mrs. Serdas in uh, her initial presentation, uh, to which I, I, I think uh, what I'm going to say follows on uh, uh, you know, very nicely. So let me start uh, from two policy areas uh, that were already part of the uh, of the latest action plan. Uh, one is the regulation of food marketing uh, to children. Uh, so in the years, you know, since the implementation of the uh, of the latest action plan, uh, we have gathered a very large amount of evidence, and we, we know very well, and we have very good evidence now that marketing influences what children eat and drink. Uh, but we we still don't have uh, uh, clear-cut and very strong evidence uh, that regulation can really make a difference in terms of uh, what children are eating and, uh, uh, and what their diets are. Uh, to some extent, uh, there has been a, a major development uh, in uh, the, the, the international landscape, uh, which has been uh, that industry has been uh, launching a number of a very large number of pledges and commitments, uh, voluntary pledges and commitments. Uh, uh, that are likely to have preempted uh, more widespread government action. So the, the, the hope uh, that more governments would adopt uh, uh, structured uh, uh, marketing regulation policies uh, uh, has been somehow, uh, as I say, preempted by uh, voluntary actions by industry, which we know uh, have been uh, ineffective based on the evidence that has been produced on, uh, on the impacts of those uh, initiatives. Uh, uh, the, the big question here is that policy design is extremely challenging because it's really difficult to avoid loopholes in, uh, in uh, the, the implementation of these policies uh, and marketing approaches evolve very rapidly. I mean, there is uh, a, a very large amount of work that has been done, uh, especially by WHO Kremlin, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll talk about this uh, in a moment. Uh, uh, with the click framework and, uh, and other initiatives uh, that, that has really uh, promoted effective, effective policy approaches. But uh, uh, the, the, the risk is that uh, the policy development is outpaced by uh, developments in marketing techniques, uh, particularly uh, using digital media and, uh, and social networks, uh, which is really uh, making it very difficult for regulators to uh, reduce uh, children's exposure to marketing. So th this is a, remains a promising area, but um, uh, th there needs to be uh, a step change in the pace at which uh, policy is developed uh, if we really want to make a difference. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, the second area is school-based programs, uh, the, the importance of which was emphasized in, uh, in the previous action plan. Uh, we, this is an area in which we really have very good evidence of effectiveness of uh, 
uh, of programs. Uh, and we know that uh, the best results are obtained by combining nutrition and physical activity elements. Uh, now, there are new opportunities offered, uh, which perhaps were not uh, uh, on the radar screen uh, at the time when uh, the previous action plan was developed uh, in terms of food procurement policies, uh, which have uh, a great potential to complement programs at the school level uh, to improve the environment in which uh, children spend much of their day. Uh, the, the, the aspect on which we are still unsure about is the sustainability of, uh, of the effects of these programs. Uh, we don't know whether uh, you know, the children will continue to uh, retain uh, the improved behaviors uh, that, uh, they, uh, that they have during the delivery of these programs uh, after they leave school or uh, as they grow older. Uh, that it remains an uncertain point, uh, but uh, we know that there is a big value in uh, reducing the likelihood of uh, developing obesity while they are at school. And this is effectively what these programs are achieving. Uh, this policy area requires scaling up. I mean, we, we, know, have effect, we know what uh, policy approaches are effective, but we need to implement them uh, more widely in countries. Uh, so the, the next action plan will really need to emphasize this. The next one, please. So the next area is uh, fiscal policies. I mean, at the time the, the action plan was developed, uh, fiscal policies were only beginning to surface uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the food and non-alcoholic beverage area. Uh, so th there wasn't really much evidence of uh, what could be achieved by using these policies. Now we know a lot more. There is a, a very large amount of evidence that has been produced on these policies. And we know that they are very effective means of reducing uh, sugar sweetened beverage intake, uh, particularly uh, when the, these uh, fiscal policies are applied to sugar sweetened beverages, which is the main area to which they've been applied. Uh, but the question we have not been able to answer so far is what difference they make in uh, these taxes make in uh, children's uh, overall diets. Uh, and the evidence uh, so far, I mean, at least if we look at the latest evidence that has been produced, for instance, on, uh, on Mexico's uh, taxes on sugar sweetened beverages and uh, um, energy dense uh, foods uh, suggests uh, that calorie intake may not have changed that much and there may even uh, be uh, increases in, uh, in some uh, nutrients like saturated fat and sodium which of course uh, partly upset the benefits of, uh, of sugar reduction from these taxes. Uh, so this suggests uh, that these taxes need to be developed uh, in a different way. I mean, we need to uh, make these taxes much more comprehensive and we need to provide uh, a holistic set of incentives uh, in uh, uh, people's uh, food choices uh, that, that will really drive an improvement uh, throughout the diet, uh, people's diet, and particularly children's diet, uh, uh, and not just uh, you know uh, limit the use of fiscal policies to a very narrow area, uh, targeting a, a small uh, range of uh, of food or non-alcoholic beverages. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, the, the other area that has uh, been developed tremendously is uh, front of pack nutrition labeling. Uh, again, I mean, this is an area in which we knew relatively little at the time the, the previous action plan was developed. Uh, now we know a lot more that we have a very effective uh, labeling schemes uh, that have been tested over and over again in multiple studies. Their uh, association with uh, improved nutrition and uh, health have, uh, has been uh, uh, you know, shown empirically. So the evidence base is very strong, but we know that the, you know, what limits the effects of, uh, of these policies, uh, the fact that uh, the effects are relatively small in changing people's choices, but also few people who use labels. And that is a major limitation. And some studies report that as few as uh, 15 to 20% of people are actually using labels. And labels only cover, cover part of the uh, food supply. So not all foods that people consume uh, are labeled and can be, uh, you know, their choices can be informed uh, by labeling. Uh, clearly, the, the initiative that uh, uh, Mrs. Serdas was mentioning uh, as part of the farm to fork strategy uh, to introduce uh, uniform uh, uh, labeling across the European Union and potentially make it mandatory would be a major step forward in, uh, in this direction. Uh, and this may actually become a basis for the convergence of different policy incentives if uh, nutrition labels are based uh, as they are at the moment, or at least the, the most effective ones uh, on uh, nutrient profiling models. Uh, the same nutrient profiling models can be used as a basis for other policies. Uh, and uh, this would uh, uh, you know, create, as I say, a convergence of, uh, 
of, of incentives uh, that would be um, uh, driven uh, uniformly by a set of uh, nutritional standards and criteria uh, that would have much bigger chances of improving uh, the diets of children and, uh, and of the population more widely. Uh, the next one, please. What I want to emphasize here uh, is uh, as part of the findings of the STOP project, and uh, this is a very important area of work, uh, more focused on the determinants than on policies, but it does have uh, important policy implications, uh, is uh, that the exposures uh, that we really need to tackle when we talk about childhood obesity are exposures that happen very early on in life and even before life starts. In fact, uh, we, we have uh, produced evidence uh, that, that highlights the uh, effects uh, that can be generated uh, uh, in, uh, um, in children uh, by risk factors uh, that are measured uh, before birth, uh, uh, you know, during the, the gestational period uh, and also even before conception. Uh, so there are factors, and again, uh, this links up very nicely with what uh, Mrs. Service was emphasizing in her uh, talk initially, uh, so the, the, there is a clear link uh, between these very early life exposures and prenatal exposures uh, to the development of childhood obesity and some of the risks uh, that are typically associated with uh, high BMI, including cardiovascular risk uh, measured at a very early stage in life. Uh, what we have emphasized in, uh, in our project is that adolescence uh, is a critical age uh, for, for the outcomes of childhood obesity. If we uh, avoid uh, uh, you know, obesity in adolescence, uh, the uh, children are likely uh, to have a, um, uh, not to suffer from uh, disadvantage in, uh, in their educational uh, curriculum, as well as uh, as they move on to uh, you know the labor market after their education, and also the chances that they may uh, develop obesity in adulthood uh, are much uh, lower if they're not uh, uh, if they do not have obesity in adolescence. Uh, so adolescence is a really uh, critical age uh, for uh, outcomes in uh, in uh, in children, and we really need to do all we can to ensure that children arrive, uh, get to that stage of their life uh, not being obese. Uh, the next one, please, uh, just to conclude, uh, uh, I want to emphasize that the evidence base has evolved uh, dramatically since the last action plan and the new action plan will have to take into account uh, uh, and take stock of the evidence of the new evidence that has been produced. Uh, in some cases, new effective solutions have emerged uh, that uh, there is now evidence that social marketing initiatives as well as uh, uh, taxes or front of pack labeling uh, can be part of an effective package of initiatives uh, of actions uh, against childhood obesity. But evidence has also taught us uh, that we need to be realistic in our expectations uh, and not all policies individually can have a major impact on childhood obesity. What we need to look for is really synergies between different types of policies and coherence of incentives uh, across policies. I stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Franco. Quite an impressive body of work and body of evidence uh, to feed towards the next uh, European Action Plan. Um, then over to our next speaker to share his views on how the next European Action Plan uh, to tackle childhood obesity should look like. Uh, Kremlin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Milka. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think, uh, thank you, Franco, for that uh, overview that you presented from the STOP project. It's very relevant, and I think we agree with uh, all those findings as a partner in the project, and together learning with the uh, STOP uh, partners uh, and the other stakeholders about these new developments, what we have learned uh, in the last few years. From the WHO side, I think if you need to see a Euro to uh, answer these questions, we also started working on it from two angles. One, we also know about the current focus on cancer. And as WHO, we are looking at from different technical programs, how can we contribute to achieve those beating cancer plan and through alcohol, so tobacco and through obesity as well. So with that in focus, we are producing a report, a WHO European report on obesity which will be launched on 4th of March, uh, 2022. And that report will have a series of chapters, including the latest statistics 
about the obesity in different age groups, about the link between obesity and cancer, current policy implementation, and gaps in policy implementation. So we are trying to be, build a comprehensive picture with one report to provide our inputs for such European discussion. And I hope we are building it with a group of uh, experts, as well as some of the uh, non-state actors, uh, NGOs, and which will be reviewed by member states as well. So we hope this report uh, the, in March next year will provide a lot of discussion points that you are looking for. Let me touch upon a few points that I heard uh, in both the uh, speakers. We heard the sustainable healthy diets uh, component, which is highlighted in the farm to fork strategy. So WHO has been looking at this topic and we launched a seven work stream to support member states for sustainable healthy diets. And it's on our website, I can share the link later, a meeting report which we had with sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable healthy diets and with the member states asking them what do they want from WHO uh, to support these policies. So I will share that report and there are very good statements from member states what they like us to do. And that provides a basis for our work. Of course, labeling is top of the agenda and we have now completed a systematic reviews looking at different type of nutrient profile models which could be used for healthy and sustainable labeling which will be published next month. We also heard from Franco and others about procurement. We will be publishing a manual on sustainable and healthy food procurement, which could be used for, of course, schools and other places as well. And for SSB taxation, there are 10 countries in our region, WH European region, who has implemented a tax on SSBs. We have interviewed uh, health and finance uh, ministry stakeholders from those 10 countries to learn what were the barriers, why did they think about the tax, was it thinking about the health, or was it thinking about the revenue, and their advice for other countries who are thinking about a such tax and how it should be implemented. And together with that paper, which is coming out very soon on the European Journal of Public Health, there'll be a report on our website about that. And we are currently conducting a study about the industry interference for those taxations in those countries. And from stakeholders, we are collecting data and that report will also be available. Uh, we heard a uh, lot about the uh, marketing, and as uh, Franco mentioned, we have been working on click framework because one of the issues we had was when political leadership was ready to implement policies to tackle digital marketing, uh, there was an argument that you don't have a good monitoring tool. Why are you going to introduce a policy that you cannot monitor? So we have been focusing last three, four years, really addressing that issue. How can we give a useful, practical tool for countries to monitor digital marketing? So when we have a policy, they can monitor what's happening. But we recognize this is a fast moving area. Now there's a lot of marketing inside games, within games, which is not even captured in the current framework we have. We are trying to tackle social media, but inside the games is another area that we need to tackle. Second part is we are always focused on this high fat, salt, sugar food through a nutrient profile, understanding which food should be allowed to market it. But member states tell us now a lot of companies are doing brand marketing in digital media. They are marketing the whole brand of a restaurant or a chain restaurant or a product, which is very difficult to tackle through nutrient profile models. So I think our next phase should be really tackle brand marketing and also games. Now, uh, with that, we are working closely with the Best Remap project where they are trying to harmonize a nutrient profile model across the Europe. I think this is very important. If different countries and different organizations come up with different ways of classifying healthy and unhealthy foods, that's going to cause a lot of confusion. So it's very important that we have a harmonized tool. So we fully support as WHO uh, with that uh, approach. And also WHO has a, a regional director launch, a flagship initiative under the European program of work, behavioral and cultural insight, how to use that science for our policies. And we are really trying to understand how to use behavioral and cultural insight lens in our messaging, but also in policy development and testing our interventions and in other areas. 
Uh, as WHO, we will be organizing a conference on 14th and 15th December about the role of digital solutions to tackle non-communicable diseases. We'll be looking at different digital tools for collection of data, either on marketing or obesity prevalence, and also service provision, and what has the capacity to really scale up to provide solution for these challenges we have, such as obesity. And that meeting uh, is going to provide some answers. So these are some of the our ongoing work. And uh, I also want to highlight the breastfeeding. That is, as you know, WHO European region is has the lowest exclusive, exclusive breastfeeding rates, and we really want to work with stakeholders uh, to address that. We provide the best evidence about the benefits of breastfeeding, but we have not been good at translating that evidence into policy and action. So those are our initial thoughts, Milk, and thank you for inviting us. Thank you very much, Kremlin. What an amazing breadth of work, and you call it just a few, uh, you know, like few streams of work. Um, now, over to you, Jacqueline, it won't be an easy task. So are there any gaps to fill after these, uh, these three presentations? Hello, everybody. Um, simple answer, yes. <laughs> so um, I will try and keep myself fairly brief. But for those of you who do know me, that's actually quite a challenge in itself. So um, I'm going to start uh, with a few points in terms of um, opportunities, I would say, rather than gaps. So um, firstly, uh, I think it's really important, um, in fact, what Franco was saying uh, in terms of you know, the science and the rationale has moved forward. So the available evidence has moved forward considerably since, um, since the uh, formulation of the uh, previous uh, strategy on childhood obesity. And EASO, the European Association for the Study of Obesity, um, was very much involved um, in the high level stakeholder group attached to that, which at the time was uh, healthy diets and uh, physical activity, which I think you know speaks for itself really, in that now, as Franco was mentioning, we're so much more aware certainly from a scientific perspective, in terms of uh, the biology behind obesity. And I think that is really, really important and the really major opportunity that we have, which I'll move through. Because firstly, um, we have a few dilemmas, uh, which are that um, clearly uh, COVID has demonstrated that obesity is not just about eat less, move more. So it really brought to light um, uh, you know, the importance of the impact of genetics, physical environment on the biology of the child and adolescent. And actually, uh, again, as Franco uh, very well pointed out, um, you know, what about the mother during pregnancy? So all of these things have an impact. So we can't just keep on you know, business as usual pre-COVID saying, well, let's only look at fiscal policies, let's only look at school meals, because actually what it boils down to is that those are, if you like, top down interventions, which clearly don't work because we just have to look at the conservative, um, the conservative uh, um, uh, estimated prevalence of obesity and how much it's costing. Then our second uh, uh, dilemma at the moment is, it, you know, it's like a double-edged sword because as many of you will already be aware, um, on uh, World Obesity Day Europe this year, um, the European Commission uh, via the Joint Research Centre, so DG Research and Innovation, um, categorised obesity as a chronic disease in its own right. Now, um, and I quote, and very happy to send the link to the policymakers obesity brief, pre-obesity, brackets, overweight, and obesity are medical conditions marked by an abnormal and or excessive accumulation of body fat that represents risk to health. So uh, I would say um, modernizing slightly the terminology from the WHO definition, and then the commission goes on to state 
Obesity is a chronic relapsing disease, which in turn acts as a gateway to a range of other non-communicable diseases, such as diabetes, cardi cardiovascular diseases, and cancer. So what we're faced with is a fantastic headline, I mean, really fantastic, which gives us um, you know, an evidence-based uh, framework, as it were, in order to move forward. And again, as Franco was saying, um, to actually link and interconnect the various, quite frankly, sometimes to an onlooker, random policies um, for uh, childhood and other uh, uh, forms of obesity throughout the, the life course, we actually finally have something uh, where we can hang, you know, we, we can actually hang the narrative. But, and it's a really big but, um, the, 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 the dilemma really lies in that there are no strategies at European level uh, that actually address obesity as a chronic disease within the same framework and continuum as other chronic diseases. So we have a lot of population level mm -hmm. uh, primary prevention strategies, but again, we know that for instance, with gestational uh, obesity, um, it, it's not about preventing the mother from uh, having obesity because that's a bit too late. So actually what we're looking at is treating obesity and that's lifelong because as we say, you can shrink those adipose tissue, you can't get rid of them once they're fixed as an adult. Um, and so what we're faced with is that uh, we have a great headline, great framework, but nothing to fill it. Um, all the way through from research um, through to implementation strategies uh, and policy interventions to enable that. Um, within AASO, we've just completed and are literally about to send out as well, um, a 37 uh, organization consultation on a research gap analysis um, for the EU research agenda. Uh, respondents to the survey included WHO and OECD. This is not just a, oh, it's those scientists issue. It's actually a really tough um, discussion and challenge for everyone because we've got decades of basically following eat less, move more with uh, no umbrella. So there where we're faced with, um, what I would say in terms of where do we go from here? Because, you know, it doesn't sound like there is a solution. Yes, there is. Um, but it needs to be a step-by-step -step solution. Moving through into the new plan, um, what we're at this point recommending, um, but obviously to be discussed, and uh, essentially will be um, that uh, we pick up, because there's no point reinventing the wheel, but if we look closely at the 2014 to 2020 plan, adiposity, adiposity is very well mentioned, but there's no explanation. And that brings me on to the next point, which is the biggest gap that I see missing, apart from the dearth of relevant evidence to uh, implement as a chronic disease, but it's actually what I would call the um, why. We have a lot of strategies I've talked about umbrella narrative, but we have a lot of strategies which are actually literally telling people, do this, do that, X, Y, Z, without explaining why. And uh, if we want to put that into policy speak, we're talking about health literacy for all stakeholders so that they understand the why behind certain uh, system level policies that they understand um, the why, just like we're told, um, cancer screening, really, really important. Um, and we're told why, well, because if you don't, you're going to die a lot faster if we don't actually catch the cancer quickly, particularly with women, different types of cervical cancer. We actually don't explain the why behind uh, you know, what is so bad about sugar. Personally, as somebody also living with obesity, 
Um, one spoonful of sugar is the same to me as 10, quite frankly, because I understand that the why, certainly in mine and other cases, it's about inflammation. So, and it's that inflammation which actually triggers the biology, let's say, into not uh, into the system not working properly. It blocks the receptors. So, and that could be anything. It's whatever causes inflammation in that person. So, I think it, it's really important if we really want to see uh, the not just the prevalence number shift because at best those are conservative estimates. BMI, as we know, is uh, prob problematic. It's definitely problematic when talking about children and adolescents. Um, it's definitely problematic when we're talking about different ethnicities um, and genders. And so what we would advocate for is that obesity is actually charted along the life course, as Sara Serdas uh, mentioned as well, that there is a... a he said, in effect, harmonization framework for national plans at EU level. Uh, we provide the uh, secre expert secretariat for the MEP interest group as well. So there's been a lot of discussion um, that, and this is part of the uh, call to action from the MEP interest group as well. So we'll have more on that. Um, but basically to make sure that uh, it's not just transactional, oh, children, oh, adolescents, oh, we'll have these random policies that actually make sense, but not in the way that they're rolled out because it, it, the picture is not complete. So we're advocating to, to have a framework to complete the picture, which means uh, national plans along the life course, just like we have national plans for cancer, for diabetes, that there is actually an interconnectivity in terms of the data that goes beyond prevalence, um, actually looks at obesity as a disease, as a chronic disease, and, and uh, also picks up on those uh, biological markers um, that obesity in the uh, WHO uh, setting, which of course, it's a trio of uh, policy between WHO and OECD in the EU, um, that they're actually able to take this through and say, okay, we see how well we've managed to do with cancer. We see on paper what's going on with diabetes. We're acknowledging that uh, you know, we're following the science. We're following the uh, and implementing the Joint Research Center policy brief and move through, but bring everybody else with them so that actually we understand why we're doing it and why it's not worth our while not to do it. I didn't think I could fill five minutes. I think I went over. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Uh, we are left with a bit of time for for quick questions and quick answers. Uh, and I think I saw one um, coming through the chat box for Kremlin. It is, how can EU and WHO activities be better streamlined to make a dent in fighting childhood obesity? Kremlin, can you take that one? Yeah, I can. Uh, I can take that one. Uh, I think uh, the answer is, through member states, right? Our common governance is member states. So how can we be aligned? The member states are the same thing from us and from EU. So I think our we are governed by member states. What we should do and what are the priorities are set at our regional committee by the member states. So and that's our mandate to work on. So that's what I express to you based on that mandate, the areas we work on. I'm pretty sure member states ask the same things from the EU and the commission as well. So if we uh, are guided by member states with similar requests, uh, that means we are all going in the same direction. But we have a very good understanding. We have regular interactions, uh, either through evidence or policies, and especially through the cancer plan. And we try at the technical level as much as we can uh, to align. And you heard, heard from the MEP about the EU for Health program. Even through that program, we are trying to identify common priorities. Thank you. Thank you very much for that one. 
Um, Franco, maybe a quick one for you. Um, the STOP project has a strong focus on disadvantaged children and families. Now, how do you see the EU's ability to contribute to tackling the social gradient related to obesity? I think the main uh, finding in STOP uh, is that the social gradient is really driven by environments and uh, the uh, food environment and physical activity environment in which children, disadvantaged children live in uh, is really uh, a major factor causing inequalities and, uh, and driving up uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the prevalence of obesity in uh, in uh, disadvantaged children. Uh, the, 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 all the policies that we have uh, discussed and uh, that I uh, briefly mentioned in my presentation uh, are really policies that would apply uh, across the population, uh, but clearly they would improve environments, especially for uh, children who are, uh, uh, who are living in conditions of disadvantage. Uh, so, those policies uh, that are, as I say, population level policies uh, are bound to make uh, uh, more of an impact on disadvantaged children. Uh, they just need to be implemented systematically and, uh, uh, and consistently, uh, you know, within countries and across countries. Uh, that, that is the key factor, I think, uh, for, uh, you know, reducing inequalities in childhood obesity. Thank you very much. Jacqueline, did you want to react to that? I did actually now that I was started. Um, so I also wanted to add in actually something that, um, oh, I, I see another uh, question actually, but um, I was going to add very quickly, um, be for everyone to be aware that um, increasingly, which obviously is a person of color, I'm very excited about, um, the stats which are being collected um, across the board in terms of health index, um, and not only um, related to socioeconomic status, because in the past, um, ethnic uh, heritage was anyone who basically wasn't Western European was lumped into uh, socially disadvantaged. Um, there is now um, the TAR from, um, uh, for anti-race uh, discrimination, uh, who's come through, and I'm very, very pleased she's finished. She's actually going to be addressing um, access to healthcare as well. So I think that when we're thinking about the different instruments uh, which, which could be leveraged to have um, a positive impact on um, health outcomes for people um, at risk of developing obesity um, and or already living with, uh, as with any other uh, non-communicable disease, it's really important to think about these as well, because actually proportionately, um, it's actually people of colour who are disproportionately affected by um, obesity lifelong. So, and not everybody is socially or economically disadvantaged case in point on the, on the call. So I think it's really important to think about that because actually it also has an impact when only uh, the socioeconomic data is available. It actually has a massive impact um, on people of color um, and, or should we say not of the home state, the host state, regardless of where they're from, but it has an impact on how uh, we actually have access and availability to healthcare and what's considered something, you know, what is the options which are actually offered to us based on a subconscious bias? Can we afford it? Mm. The, the, we're thought not to be able to afford it. So it's a chicken and egg, basically. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. There are a couple more questions popping up in the, in the chat box and in the Q&A box, but I'm very conscious of time. So I would like to ask you, the panelists, to commit to answering to those questions and we will share the answers later on. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. So let's end this one with a special thank you to, to our panelists today. And thank you to all of you for your time and for the, uh, for the interactions in the chat box. Um, let me just close it with a note that we will 
draw up a document with the main discussion points coming from this discussion and the comments made during the debate. And we will present them to the European Commission to support their thinking on the follow up to the action plan. And also, I would like to make a notice of an event on the 17th and 18th of November, um, which will be a major joint event between the STOP project and Joint Action Best Remap uh, that Kremlin was re referring to on policy solutions for childhood obesity from science to policy implementation. So watch the space and make sure to register uh, for that one. Um, yes, I see that a link is being shared in the chat box so make sure to, to be there. And with that, um, let me close this discussion. Thank you again and uh, follow up the outcome of the discussion. Bye-bye. <laughs>